Welcome back to Infinite Geek Talk, an ongoing conversation between your hosts, former DC Comics editor and owner of Infinite Heroes in Watertown, Connecticut, Paul Santos, who is joined by Keith Field, co-founder of Gorilla Valley Games and the owner of Rat's Nest Studios. Let's listen in. You want to know a, a, a X-Men Paul secret? Okay. I love the Sentinels in concept. Yes. Why are they able to destroy they're just giant they're walking ro- concentration camps. they're just robots it's so insane like, wh- like how are they beating i remember reading days of years past and seeing thor killed and out and the hulk and i'm like what you guys well, just you guys are just you tall robots don't forget context the, and don't forget timing the the idea of giant robot villains throughout the silver and bronze age bronze was age. viable yeah because you could still draw robots running but there was never a question of like the sentinels being viable it was when they were coolly, more or less, dusted off by Byrne and Claremont right. that they became a credible threat because of the days of... Because it was like, if there's any threat that was going to wipe out everybody, it sure as hell wants in the Sentinels. That's what made that storyline well, retc- work. Well, then they retconned it with Nimrod. That's why they created Nimrod. See, Claremont- I, I, I like that less. The well, idea of the boxy he, 1950s robots, well, obviously I know they were introduced in the 60s, but yeah. 1950s style robots, wiping out everybody, that's what made the Sentinels cool. But it doesn't work. Na- in my opinion, it doesn't work narratively. No, it doesn't. You know, it doesn't. It, that to me, that was the it's like, like the, the payoff we're, of it. Though. We're able to adapt to Iceman by making a heat wave cool. It would be like There's a character like, coming back and telling you, you know, one day the animal, vegetable, mineral man is going to wipe out the DC universe. Right? You're like, you're like, what? Hey, you're like, what? what? F you. But in my mind, it makes him the most compelling character in the DC universe at that point, as long as he stays a loser for now. I get you see where that. I'm coming yeah, but from. The Sentinels never, they've always been like this. So, as long as the, slu- the Sentinels can be a loser now, loser. It, but we can accept that one day they're the worst horror in all of existence. I say I never want to see them as the worst horror in existence. You're seeing that right now. That's though. me. But that you're seeing that right now. Like, nim- they've I'm leveled correct. up. At like, this point, we've had Bio Sentinels, we've had Macro well, Sentinels, Omega Micro S- Sentinels, is, Omega Sentinels. This is, and right now we do have the two, I, I would argue, coolest Sentinels we've ever had. I, the current Nimrod and this Omega um, Sentinel. I will, this is, again, spoilers for people who aren't reading X-Men. The fact that the evil Omega Sentinel went back in time and killed her good, you know, the good, pa- like she, it's a, it's yes. a grandfather Nimrod. paradox. She yes. only exists because she went back in time and killed Correct. her younger self to be and you know and is inside right. her body that's how she's evil that's that is some good i didn't see that coming at all good stuff and it was pretty good i do think nimrod is a little bit too like eh, i i as get blown time up, is going it, on and as a villains guy i i this is counter where i was storytelling wise many moons ago mm-hmm. i don't i've come around to the genius of a man a man you know I do not. I know only through his body of work. Oh, God, I'm scared. Who this a man is. named Dio. Oh, damn. That shrinking the pool down one way or another does create a lot more importance for those characters who are in the shrunken pool. I'm not suggesting we need to kill them all, but I will tell you all this. I have long felt the idea of a meeting of the Flash's rogues gallery would be very cool if it went along these lines. Uh, Captain Boomerang standing in front of the rogues saying, we have a new petitioner to join the rogues. And a fellow walks in. He's just a square-jawed thug with an Uzi. Say, What's your gimmick again? Uh, I have a special gun, just like all of yours. He proceeds to blow away the entire rogues gallery with an Uzi. Yeah, I hate that type of story. He takes all of their guns. Right. We find out his name is Daryl Gallery. His nickname coming through the DEO, Rogues. Right. Becomes the one-man rogues gallery. I like that kind of story. I like shrinking things down without removing everything from the toy box. Now, I've given you the Edgelord version of that, killing seven characters to make one. If anyone was going to cry a hypocrite, certainly they would cry that at the mm-hmm. man who has routinely cried that about Disney taking all concepts and crushing right. them. Uh, but, no, I think there's a, a middle ground. I think there is a, a way to make a smaller universe while lovingly retiring concepts or advancing them. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, getting back to the X-Men. And one of the characters I And love- I think Nimrod is a good example of taking all of the Sentinels as a pool 
retiring them down to one character who then you don't have to recreate the wheel every time you want to use a sentinel. Well, you can just trot him out. Right, and they mentioned Bastion, right? Because he's I like te- Bastion. Because he's technically Bastion. Cor- yeah, but he is the, the original Nimrod. For Bastion is the original Nimrod. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Correct. The the actual chronology. So well, this will be the heavy geek stuff. So convoluted. Which I won't try to bring the, the casual fan into play with. Uh, the original Nimrod traveled back from the days of, of future, uh, future, the days of future past storyline to Marvel circa 1986 or 7. Something like that. Somewhere yeah. in there. Uh, he became a superhero. He blew away some some thugs and the um, Manhattan loved him. That was the storyline that was going to be told. The story of a hero, a robotic hero who... It's you now have a superhero to root for who's hunting mutants. Uh, That's where the Sentinel storyline was going to go. He was techno organic, like every character that Chris Claremont writes. I mean, I mean, excuse me, uh, very commonly shows up in Chris Claremont stories. Uh, tech meaning he could shift his form and become more humanoid in appearance. He started uh, living with the, I think, the, the Garcia family, and he resolves that. He's now going to be a superhero. He has a civilian identity, and he's going to go out and fight mutants and criminals. There's a fight between the Juggernaut and some of the X-Men. He goes, he interferes. He almost kills everybody, including the Juggernaut. Then there is a massive drag-down battle between the classic Knights Cardinal of the Hellfire Club and the then X-Men, which results in massive injuries to both teams. They killed some of my favorite Hell Club mem- uh, Hellfire Club members. Leland. <laughs> Leland is Leland. an awesome dude. You saw Jerry Dugan's issue yeah. of that, that, that X-Men book of varying yeah. quality. Yeah, yeah. That was an exceptional issue. Yeah, that was pretty good. Spoilers. Shinobi Shaw is now Harry Leland's son. And I love that because yeah. I never liked him being Shaw's son. Yeah. That was good work, Dugan. You keep leaning in those directions. That That's the, the good part of your, your process. Dr. Stasis isn't. There, I've said it. I've said it, Paul. And I said it with affection, didn't I? Yeah, yeah. Boo on Dr. Stasis. But at any rate... Uh, so that Nimrod entered that fight, kicked everybody's ass. Later, the Master Mold, the the sentinel robot from the Bronze Age that contained the brain of uh, Stephen Lang, he had evolved over the years into a weird messianic, uh, 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 the factory uh, robot, deluded, broken robot that would manifest from time to time and go on a rampage. Uh, he went on a rampage. During a time when the X book was kind of gross, in my opinion. I don't know if you liked the Fault. Siege Perilous Australia storyline. I read it all after the fact. So yeah. for me, I liked it, but I wasn't reading it. I was too I young for when it was I coming out. I didn't care for it. I didn't a lot think of people that, didn't. I didn't think that the the, the weird scavenged... Uh, for those who don't know, the X-Men had a magical artifact, the Siege Perilous. When you pass through it... You are judged by Arthurian magics, and you are given a new life, more becoming your station. It was a carryover from uh, Claremont's work on Captain Britain. And it would be portrayed as a gemstone that would grow large. For those who read books other than those that say uh, Marvel and DC, The Siege Perilous was, of course, uh, Lancelot's seat at the round table. Uh, but back to the word. They said bit. that in Captain Britain too, didn't they? It was maybe. His, I think it was. I'll trust in them to have done so. I, yeah. I, I give trust to the talent. At any rate, this was a widget that wound up in the hands of the X Men when they went through a de- depressing period in their history, where their friend Roma, the keeper of this gem, said, "If if life really sucks and you're all depressed, you can walk through this gem and get new lives. You deserve that much." And I'm reading. That, I was like, "Oh, that's gross. Please, please don't do that." And so they all wound up shot to random places in the world. And it took way too long for them to, to be themselves again. Because here's the thing. They didn't all just get new lives. For the most part, they all just showed up as amnesics in different parts of the world. Right. Uh, Storm showed up as a little girl, I think in Egypt, I don't remember, and fell into the company of a brand new villain by the name of Gambit. And they were friends. Right. <laughs> yes. And Gambit was a weird, stodgy old man written like any generic kind of sinister character that Claremont writes. And I didn't have any sense of his staying power, but I really liked him. It's like, oh, he'll be cool when he's a master of evil one day. We never got there, Paul. No. Do you, Are you a Gambit booster as an I ex-booster? Do, I do like Gambit. Yeah, I do like Gambit. You I, like don't, the, I don't understand the, the sexy hatred. Creole. I don't understand the hatred for Gambit from the uh, older fan I, base. I just think he would You're be not cooler alone. as a bad guy. 
He looks like a bad guy to me. He's got freaky was, eyes. I think that was his, but that was like. He could have been a, one of the, the Summers brothers. Right, right. He's I, got ugly eyes. I think that was the point, and then they went the other way. They subverted your expectations. Guilty! So. I just like that somebody constantly talked about nailing Rose. Right. When she was in her sex. And, and once that started, then I liked Gambit very much. Right. So you go, you horn dog. Uh, but at any rate. Uh, Nimrod goes through the so stage. So Nimrod and the the Master, Master Molder fighting, and the then scavenged post uh, siege perilous members of the X Men that were fighting him. I think Longshot was there. Yeah, possibly Dazzler. I I don't remember they exactly. They pushed them through. But it was only like three of them. We can't fight them. We're the suck X Men. So they opened up the siege perilous and used it as a weapon. Forced these two robot villains through it. The Siege Perilous judged these robots, spat them back into the world as Bastion, a composite character. And I'm here to tell you that despite the convolutions of his origins, I liked Bastion oh, very much. I did much. too. I did too. It was, again, a cool, done in one villain to represent all of Sentinel Hood. And it, I, it took Sentinels in their logical, modern, frightening direction, which was just regular people would turn into an armored Sentinel. Yeah. That works. Yeah. That's perfectly viable. Uh, he wasn't enough, I guess. So we brought another well, he's Nimrod dead. into play. He's dead. Best, the best they killed. Uh, he's shit. not dead, sir. He Are was you? brought back during the Cullen Bun X Men Blue. Yeah, well, they killed him again. And he was like half plant. He again, Paul. What was your own precept? Machines don't die. That's true. Oh no, I, the well, I should He'll say be off bad. the board. Yeah, I should say he's off, off the board. board he's currently. off the board. Yeah. In the same way that I don't know, Amal Farouk is off the board. He'll be back the oh minute somebody wants to use Amal how many, Farouk. How many times has Shadow King died? Shadow King doesn't die. Yeah. And that's what I said before. It's nice to have certain villains, especially in an Edge Lord franchise, who just can't die. Do you remember? And so I have no problem with this version. But but anyway, so that people don't think I'm just babbling, that was the end of that version of Nimrod. Then, during a book called Harry Potter and the Se Secrets of the X-Men, i.e. new or young X-Men. Oh. Yes. That, 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 it was a... Academy an X, X or a, something. It, it, there, were, there were a couple of X-Men books that weren't that bad, Paul. That nobody likes and every X-Men fan <laughs> hates. In which uh, they, uh, they, they said... That is my blanket statement on those Because books. it was when Marvel was getting experimental, and I'm never going to diss them for that. Hey, can we do a Harry Potter book in the X Mansion? And so we got characters with names like Wallflower. Yeah. Uh. But anywho, uh, when when the world had had enough, they called in perennial X friend Reverend Stryker and a bunch of religious nuts to wipe out all of the Harry Potter kids. He might have been a little too dark. Even for me, that was too bad. That was too much. There might have that been school buses full of mutant kids getting blown up. But the, the thing that inspired the good Reverend Stryker was back in the pages of X-Force during the oh. Capullo era, yeah, yeah. Uh, Project Wide Awake was building a modern Nimrod robot. It didn't have techno-organic junk in it. And, of course, it Cable was, like was able to stop it from happening. It was like Terminator-y, right? Like right. It was, all, like, it was like, oh, this, wiry, like there's this wires. can't happen. Yeah. This is too soon. So they stopped it, but that Nimrod's remains wound up in the hands of Reverend Stryker. Right. He was wearing that Nimrod's gauntlet, and he led... The, what's that, What are his people? Friends the purifiers? Of, uh, no, the Friends um, of Humanity. Not the Friends of Humanity. They are the... Uh, because they intermixed like the like, the Friends of the Humanity, the Leper Queens people, and all these other organizations into one master I think organization. It's like a church. They were they were Church, church of, humanity. of Humanity. Church of Humanity. Sure, Strikers people, Strikers gang. Oh, do you remember? When and they, and then they killed him after they went to all the effort to build him into a super. Yeah. But at any rate, he led an attack on the school, so that was the second Nimrod. So with Jonathan Hickman's X Men run, we had the introduction of a third and a worthy inheritor of the overall concept. That we introduced a new villainous organization well, called Orcus. It's also implied that that was always going to be Nimrod. Like, that was right. the origin origin that this Nimrod. is the this grandfather birth, paradox. Yeah, it's the birth of they've Nimrod. They've built a Nimrod, a techno-organic super sentinel based on their research of the Omega Sentinels, which were the sentinels created by Bastion. By Bastion, yeah. And this new Nimrod has been a kick-ass death machine that we never need another sentinel uh, storyline as long as we have him around. But my problem is... But you have a problem with it. Speak to I it. I have one problem, and it's it's something that goes back to, I think, why the 90s is always remembered more fondly for X-Men than a lot of people care to admit. Because in the X-Men, 
they're always like the team that's gonna get killed right or they're 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 gonna lose the most out of if you have like the avengers the jla and the x-men the team that's losing all the time is the x-men correct up their, their... to a depressing degree to the right. point where they agree to suicide by arthurian portal right now in the 90s you had a lot of that still going on however and this might be bad writing but it, it worked you had like a savior t- like a Superman-esque character, whether that be Cable or Wolverine mm. or even Professor Xavier. The promise that the future brings hope. Right. In Hickman, I would argue in Hickman's run... We found the hope. Th- that's what I said. Right, but where... But go on. But where is the character that's supposed to beat Nimrod? You know what I mean? Like, there's it's, no... It's not a clear-cut, I like, don't view it as a problem, but it is definitely one of the examples of the fact that Hickman is telling a very new kind of story. Right. As much as I hated Swords of X, right, and as much as I hate the the mystic aspect that they forced onto this thing, I stress forced. It doesn't gel for me. Right. Um, there are magic X folk. There are not many of them. If you wanted that to be a part of this, it should have been their own thing. Well, they. I know in the one of the future parts, you see like you know the, you know the celestial techno organic being. Right. And there's all those shadowy characters, which I also hate. Just show us the character. Like, right. I don't want it to be shadows, and you find out it's all the young... I am Zerklo, the hitherto unknown first wife of Apocalypse. Right. No, I, no. No, I'd rather you just tell me, oh, that's Nate Gray, or that's And as should be coming across to our dear new friends, and you already know, in, in my, my depth of five whole years of difference in our ages, I have become a bit of an old man. And in my, my old manitude, uh, I am quite innocent. I say, beneath the glow of the pornographic film boxes <laughs> that adorn my Vinegar Syndrome shrine. Right. Uh, and and I, I look for a certain innocence and simplicity in my storytelling. Paul, tell me, is it cooler if Mars is full of weird alien proto-mutants we've never heard of before? Or instead is where all the supervillains go and they say, yeah, screw you for locking up Sabretooth. And, but, you know, we don't want to just abandon this opportunity. So how about if Apocalypse takes us all to Mars, the war planet, and we all live there. And that's where the evil mutants are. And we can see the, the, the old rivalries oh, no, that, that would turn cool. into something new. That, to me, would have been the move to make. Yeah, I, Instead, we got Zerklo, wife of Apocalypse. You they're like gone, that character? What's, what's her actual name, X fan? No idea. Exactly. And I, I'm not going it's to more, chastise you for that. It's more because it's hard for me to pronounce. The more clerk, 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 clerk. Are they, but they're gone. I'm Volflaff, the father of knives. But, eh, go they're, away. They're gone, though. Both. I mean, both of them are gone. You, you want to do something with that planet? Have the stranger go there and explain why he had a hard on for mutants. I, I will say that they're doing an okay job of bringing in. Like they brought back Leland. Um, wait, what the hell is his name? I, Leland, I feel um, the villains. Harry Leland. Even though your point is, you know, that they, there's nobody to to meet that villain at this point. He's only halfway done with his story. I'm gonna hold on to that with all the hope oh, in the world. Yeah, once Substack uh, crashes, You'll see. And, once when Substack Sub- loses its thrill, burns. we're gonna see who's gonna rise to the challenge of the unbeatable Mary Doom uh, Nimrod. You know, you. I think it's there. I wanted to also come. And this is still X Men related. Sure. But, uh, you're talking about. Uh, one villain with a bunch of weapons. I love the executioner. There, he's like, here's all these uh, these past X Men villain weapons I've taken, and none of them are. <laughs> it's weapons. true. I'm like, wait, what? Hey, Paul. Hey, Paul. Uh, on the official executioner trading card, the weapon uh, he uses, it describes him, and it says, you know, for Dente, but hey, he took all these weapons that were collected by his mentor. For example, Sentinel. I shit you not. And Factor Three technology. Yeah, but he listens. See, he to knows who's in Factor Three. But go on. Does Paul. he? Because who used us? Who uses a? I know who doesn't. You know, he had a staff. He had he had a staff with blades. No, no, blades. it's all made up technology. Yeah, it's like not none of this. one bit of it is anything you saw in a book. So mad. But it's a cute idea. I think he had one thing, one weapon. I'm blanking on who it was. And that character was, was ruined, Paul. Yeah. Because also dead. They, they well, actually, actually, his armor became a plot point in the maximum security event. And it was revealed ago. to have been made by a totally X-Men unrelated alien. It wasn't it made Z- up for the story. It wasn't Xenox. It was not one it was not a Xenox artifact. That would have been too interesting. And uh, the armor played a role in the summary of the events. And then our boy Dugan created a new executioner for that Marauders I mean, book. Yeah, I, I saw that new one. So that is the third one. 
And who knows what weaponry he has. Uh, he was in a team with the hate monger. I, I don't think it was Hitler under that hood, Paul. Oh, yeah. Are you, are you excited that hate monger is back? Well, or he's really. playing a role in The Punisher. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. See, now this was a thing that I, I kind of stepped in earlier, and that is I like a villain who can't die. For yeah, me, same. the hate and and I've always loved the hate monger just because of the outrageousness of the character. Obviously, do you think that's it's Hitler's freaking claw? Do you think that's teenage Hitler that Captain America talked to? I kind of hope like, so. I, I wonder if they'll have so. the balls to do that. I, I because here's the thing: we've gone back to Hitler as the hate monger. For those who don't know, if you were going to uh, take every hate monger appearance in a Marvel comic book, uh, actually, I'll be a little more inclusive than that. The hate monger is one of the many supervillains who populate the Marvel Universe that I love very much. First introduced in, I believe, Fantastic Four number 27, even though I'm not an issue number guy. It's Fantastic Four for sure. But, uh, yeah. It is the first true Silver Age appearance of Nick Fury, in which he comes back as a government agent who recruits the FF to take out this new villain, the hate monger, who's staged a coup in a doomed uh, Central American country. Uh, when they arrive, they are turned against each other by this villain. He has an H-ray that makes them hate each other. And various convolutions of standard silver villainous fight, at the end of which the hate ray accidentally hits one of the hate monger's troopers. He turns his hate upon the person in the room that he hates the most. The hate monger himself shoots him dead. We unmask him. It's Adolf friggin' Hitler. Beautiful done in one story. The hate monger would proceed to come back many times over the decades. As a retcon would establish that every hate monger that would show up was the same guy. He was, in fact, a clone of Adolf Hitler. When we would introduce the character of Arnim Toby. Zola, who you all know Toby. is... Uh, what, what's that Toby. actor's name? Toby... 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 Toby, 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 Toby little cuddly face. Toby little kindly man. Toby He's Toby in uh, Burbian Sound Studio. Uh, I, I forget his name. Toby something. Lovely, lovely character. In uh, Captain America. He played uh, Arnim Zola, Arnim. the evil geneticist. Well, the, the, the Arnim Zola in the books, crazy, a far crazier geneticist, uh, had cloned a brain for Hitler so that when he died during the events of World War II, uh, his brain activated and he would survive in a succession of bodies until that brain was trapped in an imperfect copy of the Cosmic Cube in the pages of supervillain Team Up back in the Bronze Age. That cube eventually had enough of a charge that it was the central MacGuffin of Mark Wade's run on Captain America, his initial run, where a group of Nazis had begun worshipping that cube as their god, and it had the ability to influence reality. Cap shattered it. When he shattered it, it gave the Red Skull some of that power. He became like a weird, lurky, shadowy yep. monster. But the Hitler aspect came back as a wraith-like being that could assert itself whole from energy. As a villain in Dan Jurgens's Captain America run. And when he would form, he'd look just like the traditional. Basically hate, hate monger, yeah. That he had wraith, the chain, he had the chain bell and like the and the demonic. That hood. wraith has gone on to possess, influence, or uh advise a succession of hate mongers. The one that they put the most effort into was in the pages of Black Panther. It was when he was the new Daredevil. Yes. You remember yep. that? Mm -hmm. Didn't last too long. No. Yeah, the hate monger was his primary foe. Uh, there were a few done in one hate mongers. There was one that showed up in Matt Fraction's Punisher run, pa the gimmick was, of which was, was supposed to be killed a new villain every storyline, but nobody would let the villains stay dead. Dan, I'm here to tell you you should have left everybody in that bar dead. Mr. Slot, you're a hero of mine. That was a good story when they stayed dead. <laughs> They weren't. Am he, I wrong, Paul? He, he wasn't allowed to kill. You can't kill the rhino in a Punisher. I say you can. I say that, that, that again. I I have taken knee at, at this shrine of the double D. Shrink the universe. Wow. Uh, the rhino is a terribly written character who's been ruined by years of misuse. Killing him off to introduce a new Wakandan rhino who is the head of the rhino cult. That has dignity, Paul. You can have big African weaponry. It'd be neat. Yeah, I'm done with Alexi. Slash Alex O'Hearn. There's a second. Slash a midget in a giant suit. There's a second. Slash not that at all, but a Russian secret agent. Slash a guy who died in Incredible Hulk number 100 whatever. It's a character riddled with 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 flaw. Right. I say it's time for a new rhino. And the uh, the other hate monger, wasn't he like a border patrol Yes, thing? it was a... It was a... Anti-Hispanic thing. A, a, a whole thing. Yeah. keep the Mexicans out. Yeah. It was a very weird story. At one point, weird. the Punisher got hit by the hate, hate ray and strangled an innocent woman and killed her. Yeah, yeah. That was Ew. not explained. That was not If I explained. needed another reason not to like the hate monger. Well, anywho, 
we'd see here and there an anniversary issue of Captain America here had a backup issue written by Mark Wade that showed that there were many Hitler clones living throughout the world who didn't know they were Hitler. Right. And like that was going to be a, a future storyline. So it's a, a villain who can never truly die. So we have him back in Punisher, I think, well, because Bru- where he's going to die. Well, in Brubaker's book, yep. it said that all the other ones were killed. And yep. the one that wasn't was like the teenage one that was like a painter. Yes. And Captain and that, America was like... That was, was actually like, from the Mark Wade run. Yeah, 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 and he said, no, I'm not going to kill this this one. And then he draws a swastika. Yes. And I was like, oh, you got to be and kidding me. And that's the thing. I've always thought it would be a cool storyline if you had a case where the hate monger, uh, not looking at all like Hitler, came out on you know a, a private world feed to the entire world and said, hello, I'm trusted speaker, blah, 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 like a G. Gordon Godfrey oh, yeah. situation. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And said, I want to make you aware of certain truths that the metahuman community has been keeping from you. And it would be just sort of a, a run-through. Like, this could be the free comic book day special. Right. You go through it and say, here are some disturbing things. Here are a bunch of heroes we all know. We put our trust in them every day. Here's everyone they've ever killed. Here's all the times they've returned from actual medical death. Mm-hmm. If they know how to come back from the dead, why aren't they sharing that information with all of us? And you go through all of these, like, Bible-breaking reveals of they know how many alien races are out there. They know how to come back from the dead. They know the truth as to whether there's a god or a devil. They haven't told us. I'm going to tell you now. And you show, like, the intelligence community working to right. shut down this transmission. He said, but here's the thing. Here's the last thing you all need to know before they shut me down. Adolf Hitler never died. He's been alive since he killed all of those people during the Holocaust. And they've been fighting him like he's just another costumed idiot. Like like William Van Vyl or, or Dr. Octopus. What does that say about every damn superhero? And then the feed goes dead. To me, that's the hate monger story that changes the Marvel Universe forever. That's the promise we have every time that hood gets that, put back down. But that head. never happens. It's never happened. Yeah. That's the story we're dancing around, people. I maintain that whenever you have a hate-causing, mind-control zeitgeist villain, until you're willing to tell that story, stop telling your stories. I don't want to see another block of people go crazy again. When you want to come down to my hate monger story, then you tell your hate monger story. Otherwise, we don't need to see the 47th hate monger die and tell ourselves it's okay because Hitler's brain is in a lab somewhere. I didn't watch it. I didn't know. It's uh, time to crap or get off the bucket, I did, people. I didn't read uh, Punisher 2 yet. Was he? Uh... It's actually, we already knew the hate monger was getting gorked before the, that issue. He's like telling it out of sequence. Yo. But I got to tell you, people, I really dug this new direction for the Punisher. That's fine. But, right. but with, in all due respect, I also didn't mind Frankencastle as much as most oh of the god, world. Oh my god, I hate Paul, it. Paul, I still didn't like it, Paul. Oh god. But I didn't mind it as much as the rest of you because the Scourge villains How do you around. do Frankencastle? Well, Morbius brought him back to life. What? Okay. Morbius cannot bring people back to life. Listen. Rick Remender seems like an interesting character. Yeah, he's got some good stuff. He's an interesting character. And I'm here to tell you, he gave me back Turner D. Century, one of my favorite (laughs) supervillains of all time. But if leaving him dead would have meant the rest of the Scourge villains stayed dead, I would have left him dead, Paul. I, 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 okay, I'm mature enough to make that A lot of them are dead, though. To his credit, he killed half the team. Yeah. Uh, For those who don't know what I'm talking about, uh, when a fellow by the name of Rick Remender wrote The Punisher, he had a cool idea. He said, I want the Punisher to fight supervillains, but if I have him fight actual villains, they're just going to unkill them all like they do every time the Punisher kills a villain in someone else's Mm -hmm. book. Mm -hmm. So I'll resurrect a bunch of villains that nobody's been clamoring for their return because they've been dead for so long in a cute way. And that way the Punisher can potentially even kill these villains and it won't, you know, take away. It won't affect anything, yeah. So he chose a big chunk of the Scourge's villains. And uh, brought them back. The, the, the character, the Hood, re- resurrected them with magic and said, uh, that guy who killed you, the, the Scourge, it was actually this, the Punisher in a costume. So if you go and kick his ass, you get to stay alive. Punisher kills half of them in the process, but they do capture him, so they get to stay alive. I felt it was a botched opportunity. My thing was like, okay, you get to stay alive for now. From this point on, you're Marvel zombies. You have to eat the innocent to stay alive. <laughs> Uh, because ultimately I would have liked to seen them all go dead again, but it also assumed that he was going to stay on the book for a while. 
Instead, he obviously mashed a bunch of ideas together. And one of those ideas was the Punisher got hacked into little pieces, sewn back together by grateful monsters, and resurrected as a Frankenstein. And Paul's got a problem with the storyline for some reason. I, I don't that. understand I hate it. that run so much. Not to mention the fact that the Frankenstein monster is never mentioned in that run. And it's like... He's actually... He does not. superhero stuff as Frankencastle. Yeah. And the story has nothing to do with being Frankencastle. No, isn't it like there's a... And this is my... As an X-Men fan, I hate seeing this. It's like, we're just going to do the X-Men again. Like, there's a colony of good monsters. And they're getting hunted down by humans. Uh, you know, Paul, let like, me bring that up as a thing that's running through modern books as as, as late as Everyone's last trying week. to be X-Men. What's up with the monster community in Marvel? This stupid oh, cartoon. For the past 10 years or so, we've had this idea that, like, all of the... The right. Kirby monsters? Is that what you're talking about? No, no, no. Oh, Keith well. will always live and die by the Kirby monsters. I want to see a Marvel universe populated with nothing but Kirby monsters. So you're talking about the horror, the horror. Monsters. Zootak is life. So you're talking about. So like, I'm talking about the vampires, the zombies, the werewolves, yeah, yeah. the ghouls, What's... the goblins. For the past ten years or so, we've been having collections of them show up in like the Morlock tunnels. Yeah. And on islands, and even in the Mole Man's realm. Oh, yeah. Right. And it used for a long time in Deadpool. Yep. To, in my mind, tone deaf effect. I'm yeah, sorry. I agree. Sorry, Garrett. Sorry, Mr. Dugan. I, I I might have enjoyed Leland coming back from the uh, Harry Leland coming back from the dead, but I didn't like any of the monsters. Yeah, crap. same, same, same. And and what's her name? Shikla? No, that that's the a, the I think devil's that's a wife. Thing. The the the, the yeah, evil wife. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The evil, the monster queen wife. She was smoking hot. So whoever did the character design gets my thumbs up because right. if you're going to create that character, they need to be some weird smoking hot odd manic pixie devil girl and she was perfect for whatever that was but then to retroactively make her the queen of all monsters in the yeah. marvel universe where, where the hell was this character during the depressing bronze age right um but there's at least two or three other gatherings of those and then you're going to throw all the vampires you're going to throw morbius into that mix Ew. yeah morbius is, which is he's the living vampire he's and not then okay we want we've decided to kill the deadpool franchise don't tell me that that wasn't the plan mm. So, uh, here's Kelly Sue McConnick. Was that who wrote it? Yeah. Was it? Yeah, yeah, for like a year. Making him the king of the monsters. Well, you've just had years of him being the king of the monsters. Right. Eh. Right. Sorry, you want to use Eliza Bloodstone, and they wouldn't give you an Eliza Bloodstone book, but eh, it's not Deadpool. But anyway, yeah, there's so many monster communities running around now, Paul. Maybe Nimrod should practice, you know. <laughs> on the monsters. Maybe well, we take it down a few Draculas. I mean, that's what I'm trying to say, that the, the monster communities have turned into mutants or Morlocks. They're like, they've got their own... You know, I always akin it to, if you're a Buffy or an Angel fan, how in Buffy, all the demons were like evil, horrible creatures that were rooted Us in Scourge myth. fans, we had no time for either. Yeah, and in, in, uh, in Angel, they're just Star Trek aliens who live on Earth. Right. They have these like, little tight knit communities, right. and you're like, "What the hell am I they watching?" Live in ghettos. Yeah, it's like, "Oh, this is the these are the muck demons." Let's go to the goblin market. Right? Yeah, it's actually like, Paul. We're talking about recent activities and recent books. Yeah, Frankencastle not being a recent uh, right. activity. I, I danced around this. Maybe I I, I talked about the, I, I I kind of uh, shot the impact by bringing up this character earlier. Uh, I love Doctor Strange. He's he definitely a top five character, if not per, perhaps even a top three character. Mm. If I were to take supervillains out of the mix. Uh, and, and I have, on as we now know, on several occasions, owned the entire breadth of, of Doctor Strange. I had been so behind on books and only recently caught up. My God! The Death of Doctor Strange was the best event book I have read in forever. It was very and good. probably the best Doctor Strange book I've read in at least the last decade. Yeah, it was very good. Maron, this thing was beautiful. Yeah. Anytime I get to see extended scenes of Agamon, the king of the purple dimension, and he's referencing intelligently every other purple dimension storyline that matters. From Strange Tales, yeah. I'm a very happy man. Yeah. And beyond, Paul. It was so succinct. It's the best Baron Mordo story not written by Roger Stern there, I've said it. And if you care enough to be outraged by those those words, I want to be your friend. It is the yeah, best use was, of Mordo. It, is, it was a very good use of Mordo. It was so good. Did you read the one shot that came out last week? I did not read it. It's I like did indeed. The Nightmare, whatever it's called. It was fine. Yeah. It was fine. I like a good Nightmare story. Although... 
Now, this is not a spoiler, and I've avoided spoilers, but I'm going to say this now as, as, as a record. Yeah, it doesn't look good. So I'm going to explain some stuff. Now, uh, y when we have this conversation, between the time that we have it and the time you hear it, a few weeks might go by, people. We've got a lot to share with you. So we make it a point to hit certain events so you can kind of intuit when we were saying certain things. So as we say this, Paul and I are in a minefield. We're very trying very hard to avoid the last 3% we don't know about the forthcoming Doctor Strange movie, which opens in two days. Mm -hmm. So, with that having been said, when a, a, a nightmare one-shot comes out a week before a movie, yeah. and there's no reason for it to come out, I know I see a certain move getting telegraphed that I really don't want to see happen. Yeah. I'm like 80%, maybe even 90% sure that Nightmare is in this movie. Right. And I, now when I was looking at the initial previews for this movie, I was sure Nightmare was not going to be in that movie. Right. Friend of the podcast, sweet-faced little Matt. The three of us were talking about the, oh, the, yes. you know, the forthcoming movie yeah, yeah. In, in, in the store. And I said, and he, when he's like, well, who do you have for the villain? I said, I honestly do not think... We are going to have any other villain other than an evil Doctor Strange. And no, I do not think we are ever going to specifically be able to prove that he is the evil Doctor Strange from the stupid What If cartoon that was stupid. I, I He will just be an evil Doctor Strange. And if he does, if he is, well, then I'll be happy to be proven wrong that in the continuity of these movies, we have the stupidest version of Thanos ever who got chopped in half by a single laser beam. Yeah, I agree now, with you in that 100%. So that having been said, I, I think there's a pretty good chance we're going to see Nightmare in this movie. And and Gargantos would be enough for me if he survives oh, the mean, fight another you day. Mean, you mean Shuma Goran? Shuma Goran. His, 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 his uh, non-union Mexican uh, low-paid equivalent. For Gargantos, and it's you know what's the funny part? It, is, it's it's the trademark, you, yeah. You, you, because but it's but it's also not been. Shuma Goreth. Shuma Goreth is not a Street Fighter no. versus Marvel uh, character that just shows up. He is up. in my head, Canon Paul. Right, he's just a, a plucky squid who fights Doctor Strange from time to time. <laughs> anyway, getting back to it though, uh, uh, the 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 death of Doctor Strange was exceptional. Yes, any series that starts with the death of, I, I, I don't want anything to do with it. And this was the anti it was very the death good. of. It was very, very it good. It begins with the sweetest little boy, our friend Bats, being depressed. And said, what's wrong, Bats? Uh, let's go for our walk, Doc. And as they walk, it's just, you're my best friend. I love you so much. And I just, I, I don't want anything to happen to you. And I'm really worried something's going to happen to you. I think you're going to die. I just can't shake the feeling. And him saying right off the bat, I might. We, that's why we just got to enjoy it today. They immediately hit you with the simplest yeah. seeming cliche Zen moment. And I'm here to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, the day you stop letting that simple statement into your heart is the day you stop believing in everything that is real and magical in this world. And from the promise, and whenever somebody's going to hit me with that, I'm like, all right, all right, be the guy who rises to, raises to the promise of that simplicity, that simple give. He does. He rises right. to a times 10. Right. It's beautiful. It is very well done. I'll give you that. Uh, Doc's one of my favorite characters. I'm proud to say we've been living in something in the way of a Doctor Strange renaissance now that I'm all caught up. I will tell you this. This is going to sound like a slap. We don't slap people. Even when we don't like their combined efforts in the form of Justice League number 75. Ah, right. We'll still engender some hope. Because I'm here to, to say what will sound like a slap. Mark Wade's run of Doctor Strange is probably the weakest run of Doctor Strange in the past 10 years. Yeah, I remember and if that. I, and if I can make that statement, we're living in a good era for Doctor Strange right. because that's a perfectly serviceable run of Doctor Strange. Yeah, I would agree. With the exception of the whole Herald of Galactus thing. You like that too much, Wade. Stop with making people Galactus' Herald. Did remember you? Johnny? Oh, uh, I do remember that. I'm not just blowing smoke here. I do remember Stop that. it, Mark. But I liked the man with the stamp pad very much. Those who read the run will know that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if that's the weakest run you got, then we're living in a good age. Yeah, I, agree. I was very worried about hey, Donnie Cates' run. He's the one who gave us the puppy. Yes? He is the one. Yes, yeah, I think so. Bats, the ghost dog, is a marvelous character. With, well, I suppose, pun intended. <laughs> All of these little elements. So now Doc is, spoiler, 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 dead. And while he's dead, the whole gimmick of the, the replacement character thing, this is not, eh, for those of you who are more 
uh, shall we say, gatekeepery and all of your cruelty, like me. Uh, it is not simply a wokeness diversity call that sees Clea taking over the, the role of Doctor Strange. Nay, sir. Uh, uh, it, it is an organic storyline element because the first and an opening treatise of the new Clea-led Strange book is, yeah, I don't accept he's dead. I'm going to bring him back. It's only a matter of time. That's refreshing. Yeah, me too. So even though I do feel her characterization is a little off the mark, now you can argue that we haven't had a, a solid characterization for the character. I would disagree. I think I know who Clea is. I think a lot of other folks do. Uh, she's a little too violent. I, I don't know where this bloodlust is coming from. But it's a solid book, and I like that as a gimmick. I'm here to bring him back from the dead. Yeah, I dig that. Yeah. The arrogance that she's manifesting. Maybe it's coming from somewhere. That's a possibility. Well, this is a... I, I am willing to in, to hold out hope that he will speak to whatever concerns I have with that book. Well, there's, Those there's, concerns are few. This is a problem, too, that uh, happens way more often at DC than it has Marvel. Pre this run of Strange, pre the Mark Wade run, yeah. Clea has been seen like a handful of times in like 20 years. Well, like she has not been seen a lot. And that's why you get this surprised. weird surprised. I will say she is not you she is not seen to any significance of action. Right. Which is to say like let's say you're slogging your way through the Roy Thomas run of of a uh, doc that lasted for several lifetimes in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll knock that run. Yeah. Yeah. But See, and Paul's not even making me pull my punch. Uh, Clea's in every other issue. And it's a would-be cheesecake shot of her posing in the shadows saying, Steven, soon I'll have to return to the Dark Dimension. Or, Steven, I'm so happy that I've returned from the Dark Dimension. Yeah, but that was like 30 years ago. That's the 90s. That's, yeah. What's that, five years ago? Yeah, right. I, I fall into this <laughs> trap right. myself. Yes, Paul. But, like, yeah, there's no Doctor Strange ongoing for the most part. I'm sure she showed up in any one of those... Miserable mini series nobody read about, like Nova coming back to life. The you know the the Herald of Direct, uh, you know the Frankie and Ray Nova. Oh yeah, yeah. You know any one of those women of Marvel things needs token women of Marvel to show up in. Clea was in every one of them. I, you know it's funny. I just sold one of those hardcovers the other day. Herald. It's a great book for a book. If you're listening, you made a good purchase. Do you know how big? That you know what? I will say something not not crap eating about that book. I like the art in that whole Harold's. Yeah, it's by much. somebody. It's someone established now. Yeah. Um, but that's such a huge thing. They bring back Frankie Ray, and then she's never seen. Like, Frankie Ray is such a good character. But she's never seen. She's hot, with pun intended. She's a character specifically designed by a, a, a creator who enjoys enjoying women who are sexually charged. Our man Johnny Byrne right. in the '80s when there weren't a lot of people drawing sexy chicks, right? And she's a perfect sexy chick character, right? She evolves through three different stages of sexy I chick. I think she's coming. She goes from cutoff jeans to female Human Torch with varying colors of flame, so you can to full, make her look bathing suity to full, to cosmic. then just full sexy Silver Surfer. Yeah, thumbs up to Frankie Ray. Now, do you think um, she's coming back? Are you caught up on FF? I am. So I think Dan. Stop, Dan. <laughs> Stop. Give me a new Frightful Four, Dan, please. I think uh, she's coming back now that he's stuck. I now, hope that, so. now that Johnny's stuck as the Human Torch forever. That would be great. It, it Burn specifically created her to be yeah. the ultimate Johnny think, girlfriend slash the new Crystal. Yeah. Because the first half of Burn's run, which I am of the minority that like that better than the second half. Oh, of wow. the Burn run. Of the Burn. Fans. Yeah, I like the second half. Everybody does. Yeah. I like the first half. I actually, I think that the pinnacle, the, the, the story there I love the most is uh, when Kristoff is put into the Remember Answer. I mm -hmm. think that's when the, the burn run really starts to end. That's when you have, and in the way of a physical kind of hint, uh, you, you have other people pitching in on art chores and stuff. As you proceed through it, everything that orbits around that is perfection. There is a near perfect hate monger story, the the whole Sue Psycho Man thing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Everything is around the meat of that. And my favorite beat of it is that during a period in which Doctor Doom is the closest he's ever been to being truly dead, other than being truly dead, uh, like in his recent series where he right. was in hell, it was cheap in an otherwise almost perfect series. Um, 
Uh, what point was I making? Perfect. Oh, when Doom dies. D D Doom is blown up in a fight with Terax. And it's right. just such a cool single issue. Burn has four different subplots going on. If you're a Doctor Doom fan, you immediately know how he's going to survive that death. And it created a cool new status quo for the FF. Love the first half of the run. There's also something very raw and pen-heavy in Burns' mm -hmm, art mm -hmm. that I love in that first half. Every issue, for the most part, he's doing something that little Keith Field normally hates. He's making up new villains. I want you to use what's already in the toy box. But then I realized very early in it, oh, every villain is more or less his take on either creating a Kirby-style villain or telling an old Lee Kirby story over again. So, for example, the character Spinneret is the infant terrible story right. retold. And when I started grooving on that, I was like, oh, this is a whole other kind of simple... Now I'll use the the positive form of workmanlike deconstruction right. of the Lee and Kirby I, run. I think that's why everybody likes the second half better. Because it's, it's more, more straightforward. It's more straightforward. Yeah. And it's more like, you know... Um, you know, the Imperial Guard beats the crap out of them, you know. Uh, oh, that, the Gladiator the issue is just magnificent. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the trial of Reed Richards. Yes. All that stuff. It's it's very, It was very one of the few serious assistant editors month th things that, that they happened. Had, yeah, that John was Byrne got taken to the trial. Yeah. It was very cool. Uh, but what what brought us here originally? Dan's run, Dan Slott's run of FF. Dan Slott's run of FF. Uh, I think I said once before, uh, it is hitting... Wonderful moments like Doom's Wedding and less than uh, personally satisfying minutes like Johnny Storm's soulmate and the planet of metahuman people. I've said it before. The world needs more stories about the infant terrible and less stories about sentient computer viruses you're making up. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I want to see the FF's franchise cultivated into its own consistent well, What do you think about the Reckoning War going so on? So the Reckoning War is kind of stink, and I hate it, and I want it to go away. <laughs> We've had too many of these kinds of stories lately. Sure. And with the broad kind of uh, acceptance I had to do of the events of Empire, I could have gone about five years without this story happening, without it just being... Why couldn't you somehow wedge this into the back end of Empire? Because it's a whole lot of nothing, I, man. I, I, and the the actual... Okay, so the storyline, for those who are curious, is that the alien race that long ago uh, received technology from the Watchers. Right. Uh, destroying their nation, and thus forcing the Watchers' oath of non-interference, have come back. And they're mad. So they've given ancient, unknown Watcher technology... To many of the villain races of the Marvel Universe. Primarily the Bad Dune. Which, that in itself is tonally deaf for the new age of not assigning uh, some sort of alignment to races. Right. So the evil Bad Dune race. But I, I jest, I jest. The, the Bad Dune are given weapons. Uh, tor the, the, the Mechanoids, uh, Torgo's people. <laughs> no one else that matters. Who I don't think have ever been portrayed as a villainous race. Right. Uh, they're given weapons. There are a few other races name-checked. It's easier to draw Bad Dunes. You've seen more of right. them than any. And you also made the poor choice of making these new aliens, the Reckoning, look like Bad Dunes. Yes, that was not a good choice. I know it threw you. Yeah, I'm like, those are the Bad yeah, Dunes. Yeah, and it's an easy th uh, throw to make. And then when you're going to draw these Reckoning... To look differently than each other, you know, in a I'm gonna make the next Thanos' children kind of beat. Yeah. Nah, that makes it even harder to kind of divine. I don't see as to where we're getting anything out of this that's terribly satisfying. I will admit, maybe I bear some of the, uh, the, the blame here that I immediately assumed things of this story it's not delivering. Because Dan has been building this story up for his entire time at Marvel, supposedly. Yes. That's what he has claimed in interviews. He's brought in uh, Gauntlet and Southpaw. So, so I'm both... saying a, char a pair of characters showed up with gauntlets on their hands that I guess came from the Reckoning? Because they, those, yeah, they you said never these are going the to be artifacts of worth in the Reckoning. Yeah, form. yeah. They, you, you don't, so the Gauntlet is a, is a guy who has a, 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 a gauntlet 
Not armor, to be armor. confused with the Nightwatch villain of the same name. <laughs> right. Uh, and this gauntlet is basically like a green, not really a Green Lantern ring, but like it's an alien. Very powerful force, force weapon. Yeah, it could do anything, though. It they, can make, like, they, they make could gravity. They the expectation when he was introduced as a drill sergeant for superheroes up, that every up. hero respected as being an alpha hero. Right. So it was a widget that made that happen. So that was the right uh, arm. Yeah. There's a left arm piece called, and that hero is called Southpaw. Yeah. I have no idea what Southpaw's powers are. I don't know if you know. What Some they, version of whatever it's, Gauntlet does. No, it's not. It's a little bit different than Gauntlet. Um, but these two pieces... They can throw things south really hard. Uh, maybe. These are <laughs> these are two uh, pieces of some sort of s- space armor MacGuffin. That was going to play a large role. Unfortunately, we've only seen these two pieces, and nothing else has ever been shown. I don't think we're going to see them by the end of this thing. It's just you really think obvious, so? Yeah, I think it'll just be they were... They were weapons of the alien races. That's too bad, because I like those type of stories. The collecting the tether, thing. Yeah, so do I. That, That's too bad. Panoply. Whenever you have the, the promise of a Panoply united and turning into something, that's a cool thing. You want to see seven MacGuffins come together and, and turn into like something Like, what beautiful. villain has a helmet? Like, that villain's helmet was part of the Reckoning's right. thing. Or, like, someone's boots... But like that's how you kangaroos. do it, man. And that's what I was going to say. And yeah, that's I... that's where we'll come full circle. That's where we'll make the final point on this. Right. Okay. So my favorite Marvel storyline of all time was the Scourge of the Underworld subplot, right? Right. And as I've described before, the, the form that that took was over the course of a year at Marvel, a gunman would kill a random Z-grade supervillain in a one-page gag or take out the major villain of a given issue. You're like, oh, shit! That as Spider-Man has defeated, as Captain America has defeated Blue Streak, in the last panel as Blue Streak gets away, the trucker who picks him up shoots him dead and says justice is served. Right. This uh, obviously was going to go somewhere. So we build up to that event. And eventually it did. A long-form story in the pages of Captain America. Let's take a better and more uh, more personal to the world as opposed to just personal to keep. Before Thanos created the Infinity Gauntlet, which we're still telling stories and making major movies about today, there was a good deal of story in which we reintroduced in the pages of Silver Surfer, while Jim Starlin was writing it, uh, the stones and the idea of the villain Thanos, he's resurrected, the beginnings of his efforts to collect those MacGuffin stones, the science that dictated those stones, and what could happen if anyone was ever mad enough to unite them, Thanos' forging of a gauntlet, and then a miniseries in which he fought the keepers of the stones to gather them. And then once in positions of those gauntlets began his effort to remake the, the reality, which then spilled out in the form of the Infinity Gauntlet. A storyline that ultimately meant nothing because it was all done away with the snap of a finger. And you knew it was going to mean nothing because California fell into the Pacific. So if we're going to come full circle, I would offer you this. Reckoning War would have worked if for the past year we saw Reckoning weapons turning up in the hands of villains and multiple books being turned against their villains. We have had aliens show up in every title. We have had yeah. we have had extra dimensional beings shown up in the hand, in every title. What if not even if it had anything to do with their plot, their new costume, their new weapon or their weapon enhancement all came from the Reckoning, summing up then in an event called the Reckoning War where we're going to face the aliens who empowered all of these villains yeah, and villainous cool. forces. Flip side, if we had seen over the course of a year in the DC books, Ares and Neuron and Doomsday and every other villain who's a member of the Army of Darkness get shackled in a one-page gag. Oh, yeah, And I collected. No, I you agree. You know what would have mattered a lot to me? Justice League's number 75. Yeah. And that will also make that third point when I misunderstood you on the idea of stories that haven't been told being referenced. Then I wouldn't have to create in my mind the chaining of those villains, it's been provided. I wouldn't have to create in my mind the credible threat that the Badoon now represent because I used my visual medium to tell a visual story. It seems to me we're trying to fill trades anyway. Part of decon- decompression could be a series of one-page gags scattered over a year. And the next thing you know, it doesn't matter what book you read, 
You're emotionally invested. The, the there prob- you go. The, the problem is that at, I don't know how it is uh, at Marvel, but I know at like DC, things would change so quickly that like you wouldn't be able to put those gags in. You know what that says to me? Maybe we start letting people have the time they need to tell stories slowly. <laughs> Rather than shift oh, quickly. Feed, you and feed if that, that means you figuring feed, out you a feed, new way to sell stories, I say it's you got, time. You have to feed that ba- daddy WB and Disney, man. You can't stop that For spigot. Sure. Can't stop that spigot. Oh, we have things like the current season of Young Justice to feed WB. No, but that's not the same. That's uh, it's a how, different WB? I say as long as Mammon is fed, his temple is strong. No, that's not the same. All it's, right, Paul. We don't have... DC Comics has nothing to do with the Young Justice Paul, show. as long as they're publishing Batman, then DC is just carrying on as normal. I know, but it's... These are... The problem is it's just inside baseball stuff I of, know. like, you know, not being able to do... Like, I know. What was the, um... The Dr. Oz... The, um... Dr. Oz, the, um... The Oz effect. Remember in Superman? Well, that, that is a, a darker chapter, in my opinion. But they tried seeding that. Remember how we said uh, uh, Zealot slash Pandora was the one who initially right, had caused Dr. the New 52? Manhattan. It eventually turned out to be Dr. Manhattan, and it turned out that was cool, and it was a, a good story. But originally, there was another player between those two beats, and his name was Oz. But they tried that, right? They they grabbed and Mr. And that Mix- was their version. It's true. You know, that would be the devil's advocate. That was the equivalent of the chains grabbing Yeah, people. they grabbed... Because for a year, Oz, a mysterious man in green, would show up in books. And he was grabbing people and throwing them in cells. And he was putting whammies on people. And he was changing reality. And it was being heavily suggested that he was, in fact, the person who monkeyed up and caused the new 52. But he wasn't. It was a... But he wasn't. He now, wasn't. there are many ways to say why he wasn't. Paul, I'm going to suggest that much as the makers of Shang-Chi changed the color of Fin Fang Foom to black digitally and called him the Dweller in Darkness, a similar thing happened when the world figured out who Mr. Oz was. Yeah. Because Mr. Oz was Ozymandias, or if you prefer, Ozymandias. Yeah. The, uh, the, I'm going to say villain, even though I prefer to say hero of the original Watchmen. Right. The characters whose grim totalitarian, his version of the grim totalitarian view of the balance of power was such that you have to create a greater threat to unite two and rivals I, is something I've always felt and, very strongly in support of. And I'm not pulling back the curtain or anything. I honestly don't know what happened. I think it, it was just short- that it got out because everyone figured it out. Yeah, so I think the retcon was delivered. Yeah, but it was jor like, and, that's well, crazy. that's the thing. That is crazy. Then it was playing up the color green, and the character was named Oz, and all of his appearances were strictly being held by Jeff Johns. I was sure the retcon was going to be, oh, you thought it was Ozymandias? No. Flip. It's actually the wizard. A golden oh, age wow, villain. that'd be huge. Yeah, I thought right. it was going to be that. And then that was going to be how the JSA came back to the right, DC- right. DCU. So I was holding on to hope for that. It wasn't. It was Jor Friggin' L, the father of Superman. Yeah, it was. It... There's no cue in the Superman music when Jor L is a murderous horror yeah. who is changing time and space and reality. Now, initially, it was suggested that this had to do with the Doctor Manhattan scenario as well that they were trying to fuse. Well, this the is ideas. the new. This is the new Fifty Two Jor L. Correct. So, not, so I know this is confused. So, new Fifty Two Superman is not Superman. He is a construct. Created by, by Mr. Mitzelplick. By Dr. By, uh, yes, by Mr. Mitzelplick. To Who in fight turn Dr. Manhattan. was subtly influenced because he was trying to create a force that could deal with the changes, i.e., Superman blue and red. Right, right. And, the, and uh, what's normal Superman, him and Lois lived in like a weird pocket. Okay, dimension. here's where things get weird. Yeah. So. We kind of going back to when we were talking about crises, and they made the best After they could the of it. After the new Fifty Two, there was a solid little storyline in which it was revealed. They went back to what the original plan was. They revealed that Mitzelplick had been monkeying with Superman since the beginning of the new Fifty Two. Right. It revealed that he would specifically divided him into two Supermen. This is a retcon, and this is obviously not what the original story was. Right. But as a result, there was a Clark Kent running around who had limited Superman powers. He almost seemed evil at times. And there was another Superman. 
Mitzelplik comes back, big, bold, largest life written by Dan Jurgens, knocks Very it out good. of the park Very with a great storyline. Yeah. And she says, yep, I was trying to safeguard against this greater threat, so I turned you into two. And by the way, I'm a villain. I hate you, Superman. And as soon as he did that, I was happy. It's like, that's what Mitzelplik needs. Because between you and a lamppost, the reason I say Mitzelplik is because that's how they used to say it on the old Superman's cartoon. Mm. That's the Mitzelplik I know who is sinister between the Frank Welker laughs. Right. Um, <laughs> so I, I thought it was great. And then at the end of it, Mr. Oz captures him and puts him in a cell. Right. And that's what Mr. Oz was for a couple of years. He would collect weird off characters and put them himself. Doomsday. Themselves. Doomsday. Somebody else. He grabbed a new character who was named like Infinity or something. He was some generic villain. They had a multiverse right. angle. Grabbed Tim Drake. Oh, yeah. That one. Gave nowhere. him some of those half gay genes. Turned him by. Yeah. Uh, let me say, not that it will slow the wheels at all, uh, as part of the target audience for that sort of thing. Kind of can't stand by Tim Drake. Yeah, no one, know? no one can, unfortunately. Yeah, and, and also, let me say again, as the target audience for that sort of thing, kind of can't stand by Kent Boy. John oh, yes, Kent yeah. in no way was being set up as a, a bi, trans, or anything else character. Yeah. I don't care how young he was, I don't care how old he was. Uh, him coming back and winding up in the future, I eventually stomached it, even though Bendis' character is in no way the character I was starting to fall in love with. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when he planted one on Saturn Girl, fine, that's... No, sorry, he's not by. Right. Stop. You're not saving anyone. You're not making the, the transition into accepting who you are any easier right. by making every character gay or bi. You're right. cheapening it, man. Sure, sure, sure. Keith Field, gay sexual dynamo, is telling you those are not factories that we need to convert to our power settings. Be true to these characters. Right. Come on. But uh, but that's my argument. Uh, for... That is the thing, is that ultimately Mitzel Plick was responsible for the dividing. Oz was there. Uh, a, a new talent is brought into the Superman family. Our friend, Mr. Bendis. And oh, yeah. Mr. Bendis promptly, into the minds of many, rightfully, or perhaps, eh, what else were you going to do, killed off that reborn Jor-El character. Right. I would like to point out that is in no way what I would do to the Jor-El character. Right. No one would do if, that. If you've gone to the history precedent shift that has seen Jor-El, the father of Superman, resurrected, whether Mitzelplik played a hand in it, whether Dr. Manhattan played a hand in it, whether uh, Abracadabra played a hand right. in it. Right. You don't undo that. Once Bucky's alive, you don't kill Bucky. Yeah. Right. Once you've gotten one past the gate and Gwen is running around, you don't kill Gwen again. You put her in a relationship with Peter and the black cat and you cuck the hell out of Peter. <laughs> this is what you do with Peter, Paul. At any rate, yeah, killing him was not the move to make in my opinion. No, no, I, I think, uh, but that, that goes back to my, it's, I agree with you because I like the one page gag. Like, um, remember when Doomsday was like, Coming out yeah, of the boom, uh, boom, hitting against the uh, side of that vault. Out of the vault, and um, oh, what's the, there's other ones that I'm blanking on, or even like when Legion, when Legion in the '90s in the X-Men books, he started waking up. Yes, and that was, that was another, a good one too. And that was another one. That slow burn, man. That that makes you look for appearances. My cousin and I canvassed every Marvel book that came out the year of the Scourge, looking for that Scourge appearance. When one of us found it, the call went out. It's a West Coast Avengers. He, he's trying to kill Craven, but he can't get the shot off because Tiger's in the way. That's comics. And that goes back to the final point, which is you talking about being thrown into the deep end of the comics world. Yes. Where yeah. you don't know everything. Right. Those little adventures are coordinating with a buddy. I mean, that made it. And you all have that opportunity. It's called the internet. You can do it 24-7. Pick up a random book. Ask yourself, who the hell are these people? And research, I baby. Do, but I do agree with you. It, it would have been cooler to see. But I don't know what the... We don't know the actual... I don't know. Con, the, with the whole... The Here's whole, the, the thing. villains being changed. I'm being an ugly modern fan when I throw that line in the sand and say, right. after Justice League 75, I'm worried about whether I'm going to get an emotional payoff from this book. But you did a good job of convincing me to hold out a little more hope. No, because yeah. ultimately, I think we could all do from a little of that at times. Because, you know, ultimately, maybe this event will turn out to be the beginning of a grand new age. But we had done you a disservice, and that is this. And I, oh, go ahead. And that is that you had asked, 
what I think is the cooler topic that we should now get into, and that is, if you're gonna do a reset, where can you reset? And so ends Milestone Episode 10 of Infinite Geek Talk. Ordinarily here, I would recap the episode, but in honor of Episode 10, I want to take this time to thank you all for your support over these first 10 episodes. We can't tell you how much we appreciate you. Please continue to listen in and share with your friends. There are big things coming down the pipe, and you won't want to miss it. As always, rate, review, and subscribe so you don't miss a minute of Infinite Geek Talk. Infinite Geek Talk is brought to you by Infinite Heroes Comics, Cards, and Collectibles in Watertown, Connecticut, and Gorilla Valley Games. Infinite Geek Talk is a Rat's Nest production recorded and engineered by Rich Johnson in the Rat's Nest Studios.